I'm interested in the reconstructed language Proto-Germanic for a lot of reasons. Um, one of those is that I'm interested in the fact we can hear a language or something close to a language that was spoken in the Iron Age and barely written down. And I'm especially interested in the sensitivity of the vocabulary we can pick up. So all languages have a rich, have sort of rich vocabularies. And in this video, I'm going to combine reconstructed Proto-Germanic farming vocabulary with what we know about farming in the area and time period when Proto-Germanic was spoken. There isn't necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation between these farming practices and the Proto-Germanic language. Many people who farmed in this way may not have spoken Proto-Germanic, and many people who spoke Proto-Germanic may not have farmed in this way. But I think the geographic and temporal ranges overlap enough that this isn't a completely useless thought exercise. Uh, but bear in mind, this is more of a theoretical connection rather than, you know, these people wrote in Proto-Germanic and wrote how they farmed because there was, there's, you know, next to no writing in Proto-Germanic. Um, at the time Proto-Germanic was spoken, farming was very, very well established in Scandinavia. So although there is evidence of hunting and obviously fishing to supplement farming, the majority of people's food was probably coming from farming at this point um, and had been coming from farming for a very, very long time already. We'll start with words for different types of grain. A research report by Radislav Grabowski, sorry if I've mispronounced that name, examined archaeological evidence for cereal crops in Iron Age Jutland um, and the early end of the period they studied is about when we'd expect something like reconstructed Proto-Germanic to be spoken. Jutland is also a pretty good bet for an area where it was spoken. The study showed that the dominant crop throughout this period was something that Proto-Germanic speakers might have called baras or gersto, barley. Specifically hulled barley, which is more nutritious than the naked variety of barley that had been more common in the Bronze Age. A study by Engelmark suggested that people preferred hulled barley because they'd recently increased the amount they manured their crop fields, which we can tell by the kinds of weeds that had started growing in them. And hulled barley can cope a lot better with accidentally being over manured. The straw that comes from hulled barley is also better animal fodder. Other researchers say that the sudden appearance of different weeds could be explained by an increase in manuring, but it could also be explained by a change in harvesting technique. If people had gone from picking the ears of grain by hand to cutting the entire stem with a sigithes close to the ground, that could also encourage new weeds to grow. As well as balas, secondary crops were also grown and have reconstructable names. Huaitias, rugis, chabro, which seems to have been related to the word chafras, suggesting that it might have been used as feed for goats. And one plant which had three or more words surrounding it. Flachsan. Chazwas and lina, flax, the seeds of which can be eaten and the stems of which can be turned into linen for clothes. Grains like baras had to be processed in a certain way to make them usable. The kurna, which is edible, had to be separated from the kapa, which isn't. You have to threskana the kurna. The way this is done, and this applies nowadays as well, is by bashing the grain somehow so that the chaff, the kafan, comes off of the usable grain, the kurna. And it doesn't matter too much if you break the grain a little bit because it's going to get ground into flour anyway. In Europe, this is done mechanically now. Um, before the Industrial Revolution in Europe, it was done with a flail, which is basically two sticks chained together at one end. You hold one stick and use the other one to whack the grain. I don't think there's any direct evidence for f flail threshing from the Scandinavian Iron Age, but they were definitely threshing somehow. Um, in assemblages, actual grain is found separately from chaff and the seeds of weeds that might have been growing in the field. So once you'd bashed apart the grain from the chaff, you'd have to wincy on the mixture, which is usually done by somehow having the grain tossed up or dropped so that it's in the air for a little bit and blowing air through it as it falls. The grain is dense and heavy so it falls to the ground and the chaff is very light and it catches the air easily so it gets blown away. Again this must have been done somehow but I'm not sure what method they used at the time. Once you had your grain and stored it there are various pests that you'd want to avoid getting at it. You wouldn't want to find a moose or ratas or even a wivilas on your flower. So what animals did people want around? Three larger livestock species that we're all familiar with and that a proto-Germanic speaker was certainly familiar with are the coos, the suina and the skerpa. People also kept the echwas. All four of these animals were eaten in some capacity, but there's some debate around whether echwas was eaten as an everyday meat or only in certain social contexts like celebrations.
To talk about how these animals were managed, it's useful to have some idea of how a farm could be laid out. Although it's probably obvious, it's worth thinking about the fact that farms weren't set apart from the rest of society at this point, they were society. The overwhelming majority of people were directly involved in farming, so there was variety in how farms were managed. Maria Peterson describes a small Iron Age farm in southern Sweden. It seems to have had a dwelling house, a yard with hearths and cooking pits, and a field. The farmyard area was fenced off, and analysis of the soil strongly suggests that animals didn't have access to that area. Peterson says that most houses in southern Sweden from this period don't have any evidence of areas for housing animals indoors, which is something you find in archaeology elsewhere, um, other than gables that might have been used to protect animals in extreme weather. Almost half of the animal remains at studied sites were cattle, 30% were sheep or goat, it's usually not easy to tell the difference from bones alone, just under 20% were pigs and 8% were horses. Peterson then describes later animal herding practices to give some idea of how animals might have been kept. In areas with not much fencing, and in the Swedish Iron Age there isn't that much evidence of fencing, a lot of labour goes into protecting the animals from predators. Herdspeople in the 16th century, which is obviously much later, apparently lit smoky fires with particular types of wood to ward off insects. Having worked a little bit with sheep, I know what a pain it can be if flies lay their eggs in the wool of a living sheep and start to eat the flesh. Um, if it's left long enough, sheep can get blood poisoning and die, although nowadays treatments are good enough that this doesn't really happen, as far as I know, at least in the UK. Um, Another problem would be stopping the animals from straying too far, although that's not as much of a problem as you might think, because modern upland farmers release their animals onto common grazing land. Um, sometimes the animals have access to miles of it, not fenced in at all, and they're still able to herd them back when necessary. Um, if there's common grazing land that's shared between multiple people, you need some way of telling which animals belong to which farm. So nowadays animals are marked with a patch of dye or by clipping a certain pattern into their ears. Not enough soft tissue of animals remains from the Iron Age for us to tell how it was done at that time. The suina is mostly used for its meat, but the skerpan can be used for wool or An awis can be used for her melux, although I'm not sure if there's any evidence of sheep's milk being consumed in Iron Age Scandinavia. Cows were also used for meat and milk, and also for traction. Uxo was probably the word for a cow used for manual labour. A 2002 paper by Tommy Tierberg, I have no idea how, how to pronounce that name, um, goes over the evidence for domestic birds in Iron Age Sweden. They say that both the domestic kukas and the rants were introduced to Scandinavia during the pre-Roman Iron Age. The kukas must have come from elsewhere because it's native to Asia, but the rants may have come from elsewhere or it may have been domesticated from local grey lag goose populations, so this is probably the kind of thing that people imagined when you said rans to them. These animals were used for aya. So how do these words turn out in modern Germanic languages? Baras becomes Old English bere and makes up part of the modern word barley. And it also survived as Old Norse bar, which I think gives rise to words in modern Scandinavian languages meaning pine needles. The Cleesby Vigfusson Old Norse Dictionary says that it takes both meanings in Old Norse texts, so both barley and pine needles. Um, it's possible that it was used for pine needles as well in Proto-Germanic. Barley and pine needles are both spiky plants and it can sometimes be hard to isolate the meaning of a, an ancestral proto-word if you don't have it written down anywhere. Um, there's a kind of mirrored development with the other word for barley, Gerstar, which gives modern German Gerster, um, and I think that still means barley, but it gives the modern English word Gorse, which is a species of spiky wild plant, um, the plant with the yellow flowers that you might see if you live near somewhere uplandy. So clearly one way or another there's a precedent for a semantic shift between barley and spiky plants in general. Hraukas has become rick in English as in hay rick and it also gives the Old Norse word uh, hraukar which has descendants in modern Scandinavian languages meaning pile or stack. As far as I'm concerned it's hard to say whether it meant specifically hay rick in Proto-Germanic or just stack in general. Um, Cleesby Vigfusson doesn't give a specific meaning of a haystack in Old Norse, just heap in general, so it may have been a generic word for stack or heap, and the meaning became narrowed to haystacks in English. And in English it may have wheedled its way through a few dialects before it reached standard English, because um, I is definitely not the, the standard development of Proto-Germanic O. Huaitias fairly transparently gives us the modern English word wheat via Old English huade, an older Dutch word weit, 
it gives German Weizen, and then it gives the Old Norse word Hweti, which I think was the normal word for, uh, or at least a common word for wheat. And that gives modern Icelandic Kveite, uh, which means wheat as well. And it also gives continental Scandinavian words meaning wheat, like Danish Vera. I th hopefully I pronounced that right. Havra is an interesting one, because if you've watched another recent video of mine, you'll know that it's very similar to the word Havras, which meant goat. And it's related to the modern Spanish word Gabra and other words for goat. This form Havra does leave words in modern Germanic languages meaning oats. So Old Norse Havre, obviously that's not a modern Germanic language. Um, there's a Cumbrian word Haver, which means oats. Interestingly, it seems like the word Haver actually replaced the native English word oat in Cumbrian up until probably sometime after 1700, where the word oat starts to reappear as a loan from Southern English. I think Dutch has a cognate of this word as well, meaning oats, so there's a good precedent for this word meaning oats in modern Germanic languages, but there's also lots of points you could use to triangulate that the related word chapras meant a male goat. So I think this is probably a case of oats are goat food, so they end up with a name related to the word goat. Um, why goats in particular, I'm not sure. Sheep can eat oats, and sheep are normally more numerous than goats in the archaeological rec record, at least, where you can actually tell the difference. I suppose sheep can do fine on grass and hay, whereas goats tend to want a more varied diet, so maybe it would make more sense to prioritise oats for goats, which need more variety in their diet. Or it could have just been idiomatic in the same way that if somebody eats a lot of salad, you might disparagingly say that they eat rabbit food. Um, obviously lots of things other than rabbits eat vegetables, but that's just the way the idiom fell. The words flachsan and lina have a number of obvious English descendants. So the seeds in English get called both flax and linseed. The material made from flax stems is called linen. Um, the Old English word flax is used for both flax the plant and linen the material. And it also had the adjective linen, which means made of flax, which is probably where the modern word comes from. The word line meant rope, or more abstractly line in general, and that's where we get the modern English word line from. German has the word flax, meaning flax. I think other West Germanic languages have that word as well. German also has the word line, meaning linen, and Old Norse had lean, which gives modern Icelandic lean. Uh, that means flax or linen, and continental languages have similar words. Kurna gives us our modern English word corn, um, from Old English corn. In British English, this has historically meant grain, or more specifically wheat grain. In North American dialects of English, the word corn, I think by default, now means maize, which doesn't grow in Europe. Um, and so people now contrast wheat flour with corn flour, meaning maize flour. And this also gives the Dutch word goren, which means grain. German corn, which means grain. Old Norse corn, with the same meaning. And modern Scandinavian words with the same meaning again. The verb threskanen gives various modern forms, English thresh, German dreschen, Old Norse threskja gives modern Scandinavian forms with the same meaning. Wirilas in Proto-Germanic probably referred to some kind of pest insect like a beetle or a weevil, and indeed the English word weevil comes from wirilas. It's possible the Proto-Germanic word encompassed them both, so in different languages words can divide up reality in different ways. It's possible that Proto-Germanic speakers thought of these things as belonging to the same category. Thank you for watching that little foray into something a little bit more speculative, um, and I will talk to you very soon indeed.